And John Bolton joins us now. Mr. Bolton, thank you for joining us this morning. Let's pick up where Mary just left off right there. If Democrats subpoena you, will you testify? Well, let, let's see what they decide to do. Look, let's be clear. Uh, the, the primary way that we uh, rein presidents in is not through impeachment. It's through elections. Uh, and presidential behavior can be reckless, reprehensible, dangerous, doesn't necessarily make it impeachable. I think one of the mistakes that the Democrats made, and uh, they made plenty, is the idea that everything is resolved through the impeachment process. And they mishandled it badly. I called it impeachment malpractice in the book. Uh, and, you know, what, what they do next, uh, obviously, but, is up to them. But you also said that a Senator John Bolton would have probably voted to convict President Trump. Well, I don't, look, I still don't know all the information about Ukraine or many of these other things. But, but my point is that the Democrats made a conscious decision at the beginning of the Ukraine impeachment effort to push Republicans aside. I think there were a lot of Republicans in the House that might have been open to a more reasoned, nonpartisan effort, much like thinking back to Watergate days, what Sam Irvin and Howard Baker did. The Democrats rejected that entirely. They made it a partisan fight in the House. That guaranteed it would be a partisan fight in the Senate, and they lost. That's not a very good strategy. Well, the Democrats say about you that you, your core charge against President Trump is that he put his personal interests consistently over the national interests. They say that's exactly what you've done. Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff say that you were choosing greed and loyalty over patriotism. Look, what, what I have chosen is philosophy. I've been a conservative Republican uh, since I was 15 years old and handed out leaflets and rang doorbells for Barry Goldwater in 1964. I've been motivated throughout my government uh, experience to try and advance conservative uh, philosophy. And uh, I think one of the most important things I learned in watching Donald Trump up close uh, is he doesn't have any philosophy. He doesn't proceed on that basis or on the basis of a grand strategy or a policy. It's all about Donald Trump. And that, to me, is a lesson for Americans as a whole, but particularly for conservative Republicans, because if Trump wins re-election, which is entirely possible, uh, there's no more guardrail based on what the Republican Party may think about him. So people need to understand that, and I hope if they read the book, they can make up their own minds. But you're not going to vote for President Trump. No, that's right. I will write in a conservative Republican. I haven't decided who yet, but that's, that's but my... Let me, uh, let me press you on that, because back in 2016, you called the election a binary choice. You said it basically any vote uh, that is not for Donald Trump is a vote for Hillary Clinton. So is, isn't any vote that is not for... By that logic, any vote that is not for Joe Biden in 2020 a vote for Donald Trump? Well, you, you have accurately characterized what I said in 2016. That was my, uh, that was my view at the time, no doubt about it. But having watched Donald Trump for 17 months, I cannot, in good conscience, vote for him. And I think there are a lot of other Republicans who feel the same way. This is not a happy election for conservatives, in my view. But if you write in a conservative, isn't that a vote for Donald Trump, effectively? Well, not in Maryland, where I live. Uh, I think uh, the Democratic nominee will carry Maryland uh, without much trouble. But I want to make it clear, I'm not switching to the Democratic Party. I'm still a rock rib conservative Republican. And in the discussion that will come after the November election within the Republican Party, and it will come whether Trump wins or loses, we have to talk about what the post-Trump party looks like. And I think it's important to set the stage for that conversation, which is in part what I've tried to do in the book. You're national, you were National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. You served in three Republican administrations, and you warn quite explicitly that if President Trump is reelected, it is dangerous for national security. What is the biggest fear you have? Uh, I served in four Republican administrations. Uh, the, the biggest fear I have is that his policy making is so incoherent, so unfocused, so unstructured, so wrapped around his own uh, personal political fortunes uh, that mistakes are being made that will have grave consequences for the national security uh, of the United States. We've seen this play out in a number of areas already. In North Korea, for example, despite two years of an absolutely futile effort to get photo opportunities with Kim Jong-un, the North Koreans within the past couple of weeks have literally blown up the office structures that they built uh, to accommodate South Korean liaison offices. So they are right back 
uh, to ground zero in terms of the diplomatic effort. And the North Koreans have had two years, two years, to continue to advance their nuclear weapons and ballistic missile capabilities. That is dangerous. President Trump, as you know, has called you a series of names over the last week. Wacko nutjob. We showed some of them earlier. He also explicitly denied one of your most explosive allegations, that he asked President Xi uh, of China for re-election help. He said explicitly, I don't go around saying, oh, help me with my election. Is that true? Uh, I stand by what I said in the book, uh, as I noted uh, in the extract that was published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I didn't use the exact words because of the pre-publication review process, but the story is correct. Vanity Fair reports that an unredacted version of your book uh, quoted President Trump saying to Xi, make sure I win. Is that true? Well, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm going to stick with the, with the language that was approved in the pre-publication review uh, process. And let me say, uh, I, I don't know where that leak came from. I don't know where the leak to the New York Times about Ukraine came from back in January. But whoever leaked any of these materials is no friend of mine. You've also confirmed, as we said earlier, the core case, uh, the impeachment case the Democrats made against President Trump, that he explicitly tied aid to Ukraine to those investigations of his political opponents. You knew that at the time. Did Secretary of State Pompeo know that at the time? I think it was widely understood, and I want to say uh, all, all of us who were involved in uh, dealing with the national security aspects of Ukraine, I think uniformly, were working to get the assistance delivered. We were we were running up against a September 30 end of fiscal year deadline, and there was real urgency uh, not to lose that assistance because of the bureaucratic rules about budget allocations. Uh, and, and that was the focus. The only uh, person in the White House that I'm aware of that didn't focus on the national security implications for Ukraine was Donald Trump. The Secretary of State has also said, you're the liar here. He's, uh, he says, yeah, I was in the room, too, in a statement he put out. You've spread a number of lies, fully spun half-truths and outright falsehoods, including what one, one story you tell in the book is that you and the Secretary of State are in Singapore, and he shows you his notepad, essentially saying the president is full of something I can't repeat on morning television. Look, it's true. Uh, I think he is responding the same way that President Trump is. They call names. They deny. But, uh, but they're not willing to face up to what the real facts are. Look, people have different recollections. I've been a trial lawyer. I've seen it many witnesses over time. I've put 500 pages of, of what I saw the facts to be out on the table. I think it's important that the American people have these facts as they consider what to do in November and as we look at our history uh, and see Trump for what I hope history will record it to be, an aberration. Federal judge is allowing you to, to, to sell your book, but he's also warning that you may not get any profits from it. He said, you gambled with the national security of the United States. You've exposed the country to harm and yourself to civil and potentially criminal liability. What's your response to Judge Lamberth? Well, we respectfully disagree with that. There's a story to tell here, uh, and we're going to be telling it uh, as the evidence comes out. Uh, the president made very clear three or four months ago he wanted to suppress this book. Now, just think about that. It's, a, it's on the pretext of national security information. But the president's not worried about foreigners reading this book. He's worried about the and American people reading this book. Finally, sir, you, you say the obstruction of justice is a way of life in the Trump White House. Is that what we've seen this weekend with the president's firing of the U.S. attorney here in New York, Jeffrey Berman? You know, I, I'm obviously I've been out of the government since September. I don't know what the facts are here. I really would rather not speculate on that. John Bolton, thanks very much. Your book, The Room Where It Happened, is out tomorrow. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.